Hello and welcome to another video review. This is Tom Clancy's The Division 2 for PC, Xbox One, and PlayStation 4. What you're seeing here is the PC version. This is a third-person cover-based looter shooter developed primarily by Ubisoft Massive with assistance from other Ubisoft studios and was released earlier in March of this year. And while it is the sequel to Tom Clancy's The Division, it does take place in a different locale and it does also feature some pretty significant gameplay alterations, which I will get to more later on. Now, unlike the original Division, which in its launch state was definitely a mess and it didn't really get that much better over time until basically the last couple of updates when it finally got to something that was actually pretty playable. The Division 2 has launched in a state that has been pretty well received across the board. Most people are saying that this is the prime example of how to do a looter shooter, but that's mostly in comparison to Anthem these days, because Anthem is a prime example of how you don't do a looter shooter. So let's go ahead and put petty things like that aside and actually start assessing this game for what it is. With the most important question being how it takes what Tom Clancy's The Division did and improves upon that and fixes things that didn't work as well in the original game. Let's go ahead and start delving right into it and find out. And we'll go ahead and start like we usually do with the presentation, which in this particular case runs on the Snowdrop engine, which is the same engine that the original Division ran on as well, and it's been noticeably improved since the first game. Which is legitimately impressive because the original Division looked pretty fantastic when it launched with a lot of really nice effects. Division 2 no longer takes place in winter, so there's no more snow effects, but that doesn't stop them from making some absolutely fantastic environmental detail, even down to things like reflections or even the animals scurrying about. You can actually watch raccoons run underneath vehicles because they get scared of you as you come along, and things like that just really make the world come alive. But even aside from the attention to detail and the environments and the way that the animals act and all that sort of thing, they've also implemented a number of very nice visual effects that really do make the graphics look very nice. Things like the lighting and the reflections, all of which contributes to the game looking quite a bit better than the original game, at least in most ways. There are some things here and there that look slightly worse, mostly with regards to the way characters look in the sense that the animations look a lot more gangly and awkward than the original game did. But other than that, they really have generally just improved the graphics over the original quite a bit. And again, that's saying something because the original Division looked pretty fantastic when it was released in 2016, and even today it still looks fantastic. So they've definitely done a good job there, although the game is certainly not without its issues. Again, for example, the animations, also including some things like the lip syncing not necessarily being on point, sometimes it not having any lip syncing at all, or occasional graphics glitches that are definitely not a major issue but are still worth noting because they are present, but none of that is deal breaking. There is one thing that may be deal breaking for you depending on how your PC hardware is, and that is the performance, which seems to be wildly different depending on your own individual system, and I don't just mean hardware because I've seen people with pretty much the same hardware specs get wildly different performance. I have seen people with better systems than mine getting worse performance, and I've seen people with worse systems than mine getting better performance. Similarly, I've seen people with much more powerful PCs than mine getting numerous game crashes when I didn't see a single game crash the entire time I played it, which was about 30 hours. In fact, about the worst things I ran into were the occasional graphics glitches that I mentioned, as well as some performance issues here and there. Now, I do want to mention that I am running an i7 4790K, 16 gigs of RAM, and a GTX 1080, which is more than sufficient for running this thing on the Ultra settings, which is exactly what I did. Now, it changed wildly depending on whether I was running DirectX 11 mode or DirectX 12 mode. If I was running DirectX 11 mode, my frame rate was usually somewhere in the 50 to 60 range, but it would occasionally dip below 50 frames per second and more often would just spike up beyond 60 frames per second for a moment or two, and it would also depend on what I was looking at. When I played on DirectX 12 mode, 
I noticed that the general performance was quite a bit better actually. It ended up being usually more in the 65 to 75 range, but I kept running into these basically second long game freezes where it would just freeze up for about a second and then just go right back to functioning normally, and I couldn't really figure out what exactly caused it. I thought it might have been because I was running some pretty outdated video drivers, so I went ahead and updated those, but that basically only increased the frame rate by about five or so frames per second, and that didn't really seem to do much else. So again, I'm not really sure what caused those, but those seem to be on the much more mild end of what some people are experiencing. Some people are experiencing some pretty severe game crashing problems, some people are experiencing some very severe performance problems, but it's pretty inconsistent, and the vast majority of reports I'm seeing, most people don't seem to have many issues at all with the performance, so your mileage is definitely going to vary on that. What's considerably less variable in your experience is the sound design, which is pretty consistently solid throughout. With the real standout being the soundtrack by Ola Strand, who also did the soundtrack for the original game. This one features a lot more rock and a lot more hard, heavy electronic sound to it, and it ends up ramping up the action quite a bit more, and just sounding considerably better than the original Division. So that definitely helps things out quite a bit, and then you move over into the rest of the sound design, and there's not really all that much to complain about there. The weapon and explosion sounds could certainly be beefier, although in their current state there's nothing really outright wrong with them. They do put some nice effects on them depending on which environment you're in, so if you're in a building they're going to sound different than if you're just wandering around in the city, and if you're in a more open area, they sound even a bit more different there, so that's also nice, but at the same time, they still could be a bit more beefy and concussive. And then of course there's the voice acting, which is generally pretty decent, although there are a few sour lines here and there, although a lot of that is just due to the writing in general not being particularly great, which I'll get to more in a moment. But suffice to say, there's nothing really problematic about the voice acting, so even the sour lines don't really end up being all that big of a deal. So overall, they've done a very good job with the presentation, although it certainly could be improved here and there. But of course what really matter here are the story and the gameplay, and the story in this is that you play as a different Division agent than the one you played in the original game, and it takes place about seven months after the events of the Division 1, where your agent is in a small coastal town and trying to help them out, when the town comes under attack by unknown forces. At the same time, the Shade Network, as it's known, the network that powers all the Division's equipment and their intelligence gathering capabilities goes down, and you receive a distress call from specific coordinates. You end up following these coordinates to Washington, D.C., where it turns out that the city has basically been taken over by three main factions. The Hyenas, a gang responsible for the production and distribution of a particularly powerful drug they're calling Spice. The True Sons, described as fascist warlords who are trying to take over the city by force. And the Outcasts, a fanatical group that are ultimately trying to cause as much mayhem and misery as possible in an attempt to get revenge for being stuck in quarantine. And your objectives are basically as follows. First, clean up the streets. You gotta take out all three of the major factions. Second, you have to restore the Shade Network so that Division agents across the country can continue to fight the good fight. Or at least, that's the idea. And finally, you're to help the civilians who have created a couple of settlements in the region and ultimately try to reinforce their positions and give them better capabilities so they can live a better life. It's actually not a bad setup for a story, but unfortunately they don't really do a whole lot with it. And even though there are numerous story missions that you'll go on that are supposed to kind of fill in the gaps, they unfortunately just aren't very good at that. The missions do give you some context as to what you're doing and why you're doing it, but beyond that, you're really not getting a whole lot in terms of storyline, and it never really goes into great detail about why things are the way they are, or how these different factions manage to come to power, and it just ends up being a massive missed opportunity. And things get even messier once you get to end game. Now, to get to end game, you have to max out your character level, which is level 30, and you have to complete all three of the strongholds and all the main missions in order to trigger what is known as Endgame. At that point, it begins the Endgame storyline, which is called the Black Tusk Invasion, where a new faction, the highly organized, extremely well-armed private military contractor Black Tusk, invades the map, takes over all the missions and all the strongholds, and you ultimately have to kick them out. 
Now you may be thinking that would be the prime opportunity to really expand upon the story and get involved in the more conspiracy side of things, because that's what that implies, but unfortunately they still don't really go anywhere with the storyline once the Black Tusk faction shows up, and it just ends up falling flat for the most part. And speaking of falling flat, there are several major characters that you'll run into throughout the course of the game, most notably the division coordinator Manny Ortega, the fellow division agent Alani Kelso, and the settlement leaders that you will run into as you're doing missions for those various settlements. And while they're all voiced decently enough, unfortunately there's just not a lot going on there in terms of personality or character development or anything of that nature, so you just end up not really giving too much of a crap about these characters in the long run. And of course it's not like you have any real input over your interactions with them anyway, because your character never says a single thing throughout the entirety of the game, and is just there as an avatar for what you're doing. So you end up with a story that's enough to at least give you context as to what you're doing and why you're doing it, but beyond that, they really don't have a lot going on in terms of the writing, so it really all falls to the gameplay to bring things up. And thankfully, it seems like that's where Ubisoft Massive decided to put most of its development time, because the gameplay saw noticeable improvements over the original Division. It's still a cover-based looter shooter where you have two ability slots, two primary weapon slots, although you have to unlock one of the primary weapon slots, and you also have a sidearm slot where your sidearm has infinite ammunition. You still have grenades that you can throw, you still have med kits of a sort that you can apply to immediately replenish your health, and it is still playable in either single player or in co-op with up to four other players in your party. Where things start to get a bit different is in the particulars. So for example, one of the major changes is that they switched the way health works. In the original division, you only had a health meter, and you had med kits that you could apply, or you had healing items that you could use as abilities. Whereas in The Division 2, you have your health meter, but you also have an armor meter on top of that. So now the armor stat is more than simply damage reduction coming in. It's actually a second health bar that once it depletes, you start taking health damage, and you can take a lot less health damage than you can armor damage. If you're still standing when combat ends, all of your armor and your health are instantly replenished, but during combat, your armor does not replenish on its own, although your health will. So what you need to do to replenish your armor is either use an ability that will either replenish instantly or gradually your armor meter, or you can use an armor kit, which takes a few seconds to use, but once you finish that cycle, it replenishes your armor meter to full. Now you may look at something like that and say, oh, that's a fairly insignificant change, but it's actually not, because it helps to remedy one of the biggest problems that the Division 1 had, which is bullet sponge enemies. You see, health damage, regardless of whether it's for players or the non-player characters, depletes very quickly, but armor doesn't. You can take quite a bit of armor damage before you start taking health damage, and that's both for players and NPCs. So if you're shooting at an enemy and all they have is a health meter, they're going to go down in maybe five shots or less. Whereas if you're shooting at something that has armor, then first you have to punch through their armor and then once you've managed to deplete their armor meter, you can actually start doing health damage and at that point, it's basically like shooting a basic enemy that doesn't have armor in the first place. They'll go down in only a couple of hits. On top of this, they use armor in more clever ways than simply an additional health meter because now enemies all have tactical gear of some description. It's not just some guy in a hoodie running around with a revolver who can take a ludicrous amount of 7.62s to the face. Now, it's people who are actually wearing ballistic vests and often helmets where you have to punch through that in order to actually start doing real damage to them. Things are still a bit fuzzy once you get to veteran and elite enemies, which are purple and yellow health bars respectively, but those are more powerful versions of enemies in the first place, so you can kind of excuse the bullet spongy nature of them, and even then, once you deplete their armor, they still go down pretty quickly. But they've gone further than simply that as well, because there are different enemy types where you can actually shoot off armor pieces that they're wearing, like say helmets, or in the case of the really big guys that are usually elite enemies, you can shoot off bits and pieces of their armor all over the place, and once you break off that armor, they're exposed underneath, so if you continue to 
to shoot that particular spot, you're doing direct health damage to them, and it takes a lot less time to take them down. And on top of that, they even include a lot of enemies with weak points where you can shoot that weak point for massive damage. So if it's somebody who's carrying, say, a bag full of Molotovs, you can shoot the bag and it will set them on fire and then they'll just run around screaming for a while. Or in the case of somebody with a bag full of the inhaled drugs, you can shoot the bag and then it will confuse them and anybody around them for a brief period of time where they'll just be slowly staggering around and wide open for attack. There was some of that in the original Division, but it was greatly expanded in the Division 2 and it makes the combat a lot more dynamic and interesting. And it also helps that they've tried to expand the various factions to really feel a lot more unique as opposed to what you see in the Division 1 where pretty much all of the factions played almost exactly the same. In the Division 2, every single faction has its own flavor. So for example, all of the factions have basic unit types corresponding to just a basic rifleman, a grenadier, uh, something that closes the distance very quickly, things like that. But the way those actually manifest is going to be wildly different depending on the faction. So to give you an example, the closer unit, the one that runs up and tries to get close to do damage to you for the hyenas, is somebody with a baton who takes a whiff of spice and gets an extra bit of health before charging you, and they're wearing a helmet, so if you want to do headshot damage to them, you have to punch through the helmet first and break the helmet off of their head. If you're fighting the True Sons, however, the closer unit is actually a guy with a shotgun, so they don't have to get up right up in your face in order to continue to do damage to you. And you can see different tweaks like this across all the different unit selections for all of the factions, so that helps to keep things a bit fresh and interesting, and that does continue once you get to endgame and you encounter the Black Tusk faction as well. Now it is worth noting that once you get to endgame, the bullet sponge factor does increase quite a bit, but that's due to a couple of major factors, the first of them being that Obviously, Black Tusk being a private military contractor has access to some pretty high-end gear, so you would expect them to be able to take a bit more punishment, but they also have robotic units that will just take a lot of damage before going down regardless. And while you do still get the bullet sponge effect there, at least it's more understandable than what you saw in, say, The Division 1, where it's just a guy in a hoodie who can take about 300 7.62s to the face and be perfectly fine. But even when you do encounter enemies that can take a lot of damage before going down, you'll find that it doesn't really feel as much like they're just standing there taking all the punishment, because Ubisoft learned from their mistakes with the Division 1 where it would just be some guy standing there taking all the damage, and they implemented an animation system to where if you're shooting the enemy in different locations, their animations will actually react to it a bit. So if you're shooting them in the shoulder, for example, they'll jerk in that direction, or if you kill an enemy by shooting them in the legs, then it will basically sweep their legs out from under them and they'll fall flat on their face. And while the blood effects certainly look pretty ridiculous, the attention to detail and the animations really does help the combat feel a lot better than the original Division, where it just felt like you were just wailing on guys over and over and over, and they were just standing there and taking it like it was nothing. And then when you factor in things like environmental damage from, say, explosive containers nearby or containers that will shoot out a toxin into the air or something along those lines, or shooting enemies with incendiary rounds or whatever the case may be, and the fact that those clearly do quite a lot of damage to the enemy or they make the combat more interesting by flushing enemies out of cover and things like that, it's easy to see that Ubisoft put a lot of effort into really making sure that the combat felt a lot better in this than it did in the Division 1, and it really does pay off quite a lot. Now aside from just the feel of the combat and the way they changed up the armor and everything like that, they also changed up the various abilities that you have to make them a lot more nuanced. So instead of having only a couple of abilities really being useful like in the Division 1, where pretty much everybody ran the pulse ability because it was insanely overpowered, in this there's not really one particular ability that's completely overpowered and if you're playing it with a squad then it's good to mix and match your various abilities to make sure that they all complement one another. 
Now, they did overcompensate in some areas, so for example, the Pulse ability is practically useless now, and some of the other abilities got weakened a bit, but the game does still encourage you to mess around with the various abilities and figure out what really works for you. This is even further expanded upon once you get to end game and you unlock the specialization trees. So currently there are three specialization trees, although it seems like they're going to be putting more in as the game continues to get more content, but currently available in the game are Survivalist, Sharpshooter, and Demolitionist. These specialization trees give you instant access to a signature weapon, which in the case of the Sharpshooter is a 50 caliber sniper rifle, the Demolitionist gets a grenade launcher, and the Survivalist gets a crossbow that launches explosive bolts. And all three of them also get their own individual progression. As you continue to complete missions and go through strongholds and complete activities and such, you'll gradually earn more and more specialization points that you can spend within a specialization tree to increase your capabilities. So for example, you might be able to increase the amount of damage your signature weapon does, or you may be able to increase the amount of headshot damage you do, or maybe even increase the abilities of your squad mates. So it really does behoove you to keep an eye on your specialization tree and make sure you're picking abilities that actually complement what you're trying to do. And since the specializations really do have their own individual play styles, if you're going for a squad play, it really does behoove you to all pick different specializations so that your abilities all complement one another. Now it is worth noting that the specialization points you earn are specific to the specialization tree you have equipped at any given moment. So if you're going around and playing as a sharpshooter, you're going to be earning specialization points for the sharpshooter tree specifically. You can't transfer those points over to, say, survivalist or demolitionist. That said, you can switch between the various specializations by going back to the base of operations and selecting one of the other ones, and your progression in whatever you previously had equipped does not actually reset. So you can continue progressing and get all the specialization unlocks for one particular specialization, and then you can go back and you can switch over to a different one and go through that progression and so on and so forth. The thing is, with only three specializations at launch, it means that the fourth member of your squad is always Always going to be the odd one out, so at least until they get additional specializations in there, you're never really going to have all that optimal of a squad setup. So we'll just have to wait and see how that goes, but what about the rest of the game aside from combat and progression? Well, there's also the loot, because this is a looter shooter, and that was one of the biggest problems that the original Division had, where the loot drops were absolutely pitiful. In this one, the loot drops are not pitiful. In fact, they are beyond plentiful. You are basically swimming in loot throughout this entire game, and while not all of it is going to be better than what you have equipped, you will continue to find better and better gear as you continue to play, and you'll find that the progression of that gear is actually very good. So to give you a point of comparison, I didn't start getting purples in the original Division until basically end game. In the Division 2, I started getting purples at level 8. Keep in mind the maximum is 30. So you're getting a lot better gear a lot earlier on, and it really does help to feel like you're not just getting completely shafted on the loot throughout the entire game like you were in the original Division, and instead, it feels like you are being rewarded for your efforts. Of course, things get really messy once you get to end game, and it no longer becomes about leveled gear, but rather gear score, because once you hit end game, and you've completed all of the strongholds and the Black Tusk invasion begins, then it switches over the level stats of whatever gear that you're carrying over into gear score. And this is where the game actually starts to become rather grindy because during the main progression from level 1 to level 30, you have all the side missions giving you basically one third of your experience bar per completion of side mission. You have all of your main missions giving you a lot of experience points as well. And it's generally very easy to level up. It's very easy to find loot and very easy to progress. And then you hit end game and that basically becomes a wall. Because now, in order to go on various missions, you have to have the appropriate gear score. And you can only increase your gear score 
by equipping gear with a higher gear score than what you currently have. The thing is, that starts to become extremely incremental, and you will often find that equipment with a better gear score is not necessarily better than what you currently have equipped in terms of actual stats. So at that point, you've basically hit the grind wall, and thankfully they do try to soften this quite a bit by increasing the number of activities available to you as you continue to play, but it still is a grind wall and it is still very noticeable. Especially if you decide to go on the main missions and the strongholds. You see, every two story missions unlocks a stronghold, and once you go into the stronghold and complete that, then you advance a world tier, which increases the gear score required for all the various missions, and also increases the toughness of all the enemies. So if you're not careful with increasing your world tier and making sure your gear score is up to the task, you can pretty quickly get overwhelmed by the enemies, and that just ends up being pretty irritating. Now don't get me wrong, I understand that the end game of a looter shooter is always going to be about grinding to get better and better gear, so you can ultimately optimize your build. But when that grind set in is precisely when my experience with the game went from being relatively positive to being either lukewarm or downright irritated, because grind always kills my interest in any video game that it's in. To put it very simply, grinding is by its very nature extremely boring. Now thankfully, they do include a lot of activities that only unlock in the end game in fact, and they do give you plenty of things to do in the end game, so it's not just sitting there and wailing on enemies and doing the exact same missions over and over and over again for loot drops, and you are getting things like field proficiency caches, which is... Every time you level up, you'll gain a box that will give you some random loot as well as crafting materials and things like that. And you can also use your crafting materials to create better gear than what you've got. And you can sometimes find better gear from the vendors. So it's not entirely about just doing the exact same things over and over and over again, but it still wears thin very quickly once you hit end game. So you may be looking into some of the other things that you can do, like say the Dark Zone, which I didn't really bother with too much because I found the Dark Zone in the original Division was basically just an excuse for people to run around and be assholes, and the Division 2's Dark Zone is exactly the same way, where now you do have to specifically select an option to go rogue, but there's not really much reason not to, because the player versus player damage scaling is all kinds of screwed up. So as long as you spec out for entirely damage and nothing else, then you're basically just one-shotting literally anybody you come across, because they don't have the armor set up correctly in the dark zones and the player versus player sections. Because the idea is that they're trying to normalize all the stats, but there was a glitch with the armor stats, so those didn't really scale appropriately, and it just ended up being a complete mess. And in my experience, the Dark Zone loot is really no better than what you're finding in the PvE anyway, so there's not really much reason to bother with it unless you just want to be an asshole to other players. There is also a dedicated PvP mode called Conflict, where two teams of four players go up against each other, but it has similar scaling problems to the Dark Zone, so it just ends up being more of a mess than anything else as well. So if you want to make a completely overpowered PvP build and go into the PvP and ruin other people's days, then that's entirely your prerogative, but it's not something I really have all that much interest in. The thing is, while that is certainly a negative for the game, it's not a deal breaker necessarily, because let's face it, PvP in a looter shooter is always going to be a mess no matter what you do, so there's only so much they really could have done with it. And they put so much effort into expanding all of the PvE content that it's pretty obvious that they really wanted you to play more of the PvE content anyway, and that's really where a looter shooter is going to be at its best regardless. And when you combine that with some other gameplay changes like the complete overhaul they did to attachments, to where now when you unlock an attachment, it's not just a leveled attachment like it was in the original Division, but rather just a universal attachment that can be put on anything that supports it. So, say, if it's a vertical grip, it can be put on any weapon that would support a vertical grip. Or, if it's a type of scope that is only available on long rails, then you can put that on any weapon that has a long top rail, so on and so forth. In addition, you can equip these attachments as many times as you want with impunity because you don't have a limited supply of them. Once you've unlocked it, you can put it on anything at any time and mix and match to your heart's content 
you end up with a game that is definitely better than the original Division. This game does exactly what a sequel should do. It takes what the original game did, expands upon things that worked, fixes a lot of things that didn't work, and introduces some mechanics of its own to try to spice things up and make things more interesting, and it does that in spades. The problem is, it's still a looter shooter, and that means its core gameplay mechanics are ultimately still centered around an addiction factor, rather than actually being properly good gameplay. Luckily, the actual gameplay does help to make up for this by actually being pretty decent, but once that grind sets in, everything comes into very sharp focus very quickly, and it's pretty difficult to fully recommend the game as a result. So ultimately, I'm giving it a 3 out of 5. If you were one of the few people who did like The Division 1, you will definitely like The Division 2, and if you like looter shooters, then you'll find that The Division 2 is definitely one of the better ones out there right now, but if that Skinner box loot mechanic just doesn't really do anything for you, like it doesn't really do a whole lot for me, then your mileage is definitely going to vary. Thanks for watching.